Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. I'm Alicia Salomone, and it is my pleasure to wel welcome you all to this online event of the Digital Memory Studies Association series. First of all, I want to say thank you to our panel presenters, Daniela Jara and Valentina Salvi, and to the discussant, Michael Lazara. I'm going to introduce them properly in a minute. I would also like to say thank you to the MSA Executive Committee and especially to Paco Fernandez for inviting me to organize this session. I'm also grateful to Lorena Ortiz Cabrera, who is the person, the key person behind all the details of this event. Last but not least, I say thanks to you all for being with us today. We encourage you to participate in the discussion by posting your comments on the chat box. After the presentations, the public will be allowed to make questions and comments. Uh, I must say that regrettably, Professor, Sam Professor Samantha Quadrat, who has a last minute, minute family issue, will not be able to make it. We wish her all the best and we hope she can join us on other occasions. As you may know, this session is devoted to the critical issue, to a critical issue, as it is the growth of right-wing political forces in the southern cone of America, and its implic in the implications this phenomenon has for struggles for memory and justice against impunity in this part of the world and beyond. In order to carry out this discussion, we have invited three distinguished guests who will debate around this problematic. Firstly, we are going to listen to Daniela Jara, who has a PhD in sociology from Goldsmiths College, University of London. Daniela is an academic at the School of Sociology of Universidad de Valparaíso, Chile, and she is also associate researcher at the Center for Conflict and Social Cohesion. Her research has focused on memory conflicts in post-dictatorship, and more recently on moral and cultural narratives emerging after the riot that started in Chile on October 18th, 2019. She has published several articles and a book, Children and the Afterlife of State Violence, Memories of Dictatorship. In 2020, she co-edited together with Catherine Hyde, a special issue of memory studies dedicated to exhumations, ghosts, ghosts and unwieldy, unwieldy pasts. The second panelist will be Valentina Salvi, who has a PhD in social sciences from Universidade Estadual de Campinas in Brazil. Valentina is independent researcher at the National Council for Scientific and Technological Research in Argentina. And she is also head of the Núcleo de Estudios sobre Memoria at the Economic and Social Development Institute. She has published The Vencedores a Victimas, Memorias Militares sobre el Pasado Reciente en la Argentina, and Las Voces de la Represión, Las Declaraciones de los Perpetradores de la Dictadura Argentina, which was co-authored with Claudia Feld. Valentina is also a member of the editorial board of Clepsidra, Revista Interdisciplinaria de Estudios sobre Memoria Social. Finally, the panel discussant will be Michael Azara, who has a PhD from Princeton University and is professor of Latin American Literature and Cultural Studies in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese at the University of California, Davis. He also serves as Associate Vice Provost for Academic Programs in Global Affairs and is one of the founding faculty of the Program in Human Rights Studies. His research and writing focus on the intersections 
among culture, memory, history, and human rights in Latin America, especially in the Southern Cone. He's author of various books, including Chile in Transition, The Poetics and Politics of Memory, Luz Arce and Pinochet's Chile, Testimony in the Aftermath of State Violence, and Civil Obedience, Complicity and Compliancy in Chile since Pinochet. To start with the presentations, I will turn the floor to Daniela Jara. Please, Daniela. Thank you, Alicia, um, for this uh, invitation. I'm really happy to be here with old friends we have met before in different places. Um, and uh, thank you uh, to the MSA committee for organizing this and Lorena as well. Uh, give me a minute because I'm going to share my screen. Am I sharing or not yet? No? no. Not yet. Okay. Well, <laughs> it doesn't matter. They are only photographs. Let me see. I will do. Uh, Can one you try more. again? Yeah, I'll, I do. I so I have to go to a... share screen? Yeah, I think you need to be made a co host to share, maybe. I think I am co-host. Multiple. Well, I'm not, not going to stop on that. Um, <laughs> um, I will um, present some ideas that come from a new research. Um, so I will try to, um, to share with you this uh, information that we have been uh, working with my research group now. Uh, and uh, the title of the presentation was uh, Counter Narratives to the 18th of October. And that's what I'm going to contextualize now, okay? So <clears throat> the social uprising of October 18th, two years ago in Chile, has been one of the most significant social events of the past 50 years in Chile. Soon after high school students initiated pro protests over the increase in public transport fares, hundreds of thousands of protesters took the streets during multiple days throughout all of the country. One of the popular phrases shouted by protesters was, it's not just 30 pesos, it's 30 years. Here they were alluding to the fair hike, but also to the transitional governments since the dictatorship. Another phrase that helped to understand what was happening those days was it was never <clears throat> depression, it was capitalism. These two phrases uh, became symbols that allow us to better understand what was happening in Chile in that moment and still today. A common topic of this social movement is that, that, is that they have framed an alternative memory of the recent past the Chilean transition to democracy from 1990 onwards, taking distance from the narratives that were built on ideas of what is possible, the idea of reconciliation, and on the myth of Chile's traditionally exemplary democracy. The underlying reason for their critique was that it was precisely in this period, the transition, that the legacy of Pinochet's neoliberal constitution uh, was able to strengthen and gain legitimacy. 
But while these massive pro protests and manifestations took over the streets and demanded a new constitution, a diverse group of people, including individuals, men and women from Chile's high, middle and low classes, they all articulated different degrees of discontent with the, with the social transformations. Initially, these spontaneous counter manifestations were called yellow vests, like chalecos amarillos, in reference to past events in France. Groups of neighbors in Chile also organized, but to defend their houses or business from possible lootings, riots, and fire. Later, these groups organized around a slogan that was retazo, or that meant the rejection to the idea of a new constitution, gathering in high-class neighborhoods to protest. If we look at their public events, we see that the great presence of Chilean flags established an aesthetic continuity with the historic Propinochet manifestations allusions to the, or references to the Chilean armed forces were also part of these retazo performances. However, there were also new symbols which began to appear in these manifestations, articulating a transnational narrative by this new right-wing counter movement. For example, flags that alluded to Trump and the United States were flown next to groups making the Nazi salute. In the press coverage of the events, we can observe men with helmet using shields with crosses on them, which assumedly referred to the Christian West. So we asked, who were these people? Why did they become a counter movement? In in 2020, with a research group from COES that is called Escucha Activa, we decided to interview 66 ordinary people uh, that were participants or witnesses or manifestants uh, in the October 18th. The great majority of these people were in favor of the movement and were part of the movement and felt really that the they protagonized the mobilizations that occurred on October 18. But during the research, we decided to learn more about what we were seeing in the streets. And we decided then to study this counter movement to understand what we were seeing as a right wing reaction to this massive social uh, movement. So we interviewed around to about 18 people who identified with the actions of the counter movement. They used yellow vest in the days following, of, uh, following October or they organized uh, in favor of public demonstrations for the retazo. We spoke with women and men of all ages from high, middle and low classes, and we discovered that there were some topics that this movement had in common. The majority of our interviewees told us that they felt they need to go out and organize themselves. They needed to defend something. When they described their organizational strategies to us, they mentioned the use of WhatsApp, sharing information on social networks and attending some protests. We learned that these groups don't necessarily identify with political parties. They came from diverse walks of life. And that's why we wanted to understand what is that they have in common. The fact is that in the face of the social mobilizations, these people did not identify with the protesters for dignity, but they felt instead threatened by them. So here a distinction is useful. The idea of the counter movement comes from the study of social movements. In general, counter movements have been studied as movements that challenge cultural or political hegemony. However, more recently, it has become part of a language to conceptualize the counter attacks of the new right. This idea emphasizes, on one hand, the contentiousness of the political field and the struggles of the state in all, in all directions. And on the other side, it shows 
this particularly related re reaction, reaction sorry, to liberal identity politics that has taken place from the 90s onwards. In some studies, for example, it has been shown that groups have appropriated the human rights language in the case of the anti-abortion movement, but in order to weaken women's rights. So the counter movement in the right wing arena also means resignifying the meaning of social concepts and symbols that are generally very similar to that used by these social, social movements that they oppose. Um, the idea of counter movement could help to illuminate what happened uh, in Chile after the 18th in this particular group. Many of those people that we interviewed explained their participation in these counter manifestations as a reaction to social violence and the weakening of institutionality. In fact, traffic lights of many streets in those days stopped working, barricades burned in some ways and heavily transited streets. In their accounts, they speak of the fear that hordes or protesters would burst, would burst into their condominiums, into their neighborhood, supermarket, or their businesses. So, so while most of those interviewed described their identification with the 18th as a moment of purif purification, for this counter movement, it was the violence and the looting that made them react and their, and in their words, uh, defend what was theirs. Literature about social movements and counter movements suggest in general that they are activated when political opportunities arise. On the right, the Retasso counter movement was activated by the social unrest surrounding the 18th of October, but also the crisis of political parties and the collapse of the experience of social order as well as the collapse of the hegemonic narrative of a successful transition into democracy. For them, the violence of the street protest pointed to an uncivilized movement that they deemed delinquent. They used international reference, like, like the idea of Venezuela, that they say, or they transform into Chilezuela, to represent their fears but they also used national elements alluding, for example, to ultra leftist groups that fought against the dictatorship, such as the Manuel Rodriguez group or the MIR group, thus mobilizing various resources that the mainstream media have used to represent the idea of uncivility and to promote fear. Social justice is not justice. That is a very important idea that we found in that group. The October, as I explained before, the October 18th movement installed uh, in the public sphere the idea of dignity, dignidad, in the country's political agenda and in the public moral framework. And this is related, of course, to the demand of social justice. This demand seeks to destabilize the idea of merit. At the same time, it criticizes the precariousness of everyday life and public programs in neoliberal Chile. Lee Payne's work describes right-wing movements as the right in Latin America as the right against rights. In right-wing blacklash, for example, speaking on Brazil's case, Payne suggests that the question of titularity is at the core of this new counter movement. She suggests that what, what these groups have in common is that they reject the aspiration that formerly socially marginalized groups, especially women and members of LGBT groups, can access equal rights through the use of terms such as moral value and family values. In discussing the social uprising with our Retasso interviewees, we could see that the demand for social justice is not seen as a valid demand for them. For them, social justice is a threat. Instead, they substitute the ideal of merit for the idea of social justice. This 
are also some values that they share. We found consensus when they spoke on merit meritocracy. In fact, they re reject ideas of equality. It is in the meritocracy that we find the aspiration that sustains for them social order. The idea of merit of or worthiness is a key idea in their identity narratives. They told us that they deserve what they have achieved, or in other words, they have learned and follow rules that they fear will no longer be valued or will lose their efficacy. The individual effort appears as a central imaginary in their narrative. In this sense, economic status is not necessarily valued by all of our interviewees. And we also hear some family stories of effort to advance themselves in the social structure. This value of effort rather than capital or money can also be found in the aesthetics of the counter movement on the streets. In fact, t-shirts worn by some of the leaders of the, of the movement circulating in the press carry the phrase, proud to be a poor fato, which is a pop symbol and a colloquial expression to describe a right wing that does not belong to the elite and doesn't belong to traditional right, right wing political parties. Instinctively, in Chile, we think of this right wing movement as being made up of the heirs or the inheritors of the Pinochet dictatorship. But in speaking with the professed members of this counter movement, we see that there isn't a simple and lineal connection. Indeed, our interviewees value the military legacy and they share the anti-communist framework. But, and this was a surprise, Pinochet as a symbol is not valued equally by all of them. When we ask for our interviewees about their relationship with Minochet, some distanced themselves from his legacy. Instead of a charismatic leader, they value and sanctify objects that represent the idea of social order, such as the law and the constitution. Paradoxically, however, they do not value the state. The state has been discredited as well as the politicians. The sacralization of social order and the constitution underlie one of the most widely shared tropes in this new rights counter movement, which generates social friction in post Pinochet Chile, the debate over human rights. It is where it is here where the Frankenstein effect of neoliberalism, this idea that Wendy Brown speaks on, becomes especially relevant, but in a different way, in another direction. The justification of violence has been, and this is a context, has been a scandal in Chile, uh, in the Chile of the October 18th uprising, during which more than 360 young people were mutilating during marches. The events has demonstrated that despite historical experience of a 17 year long dictatorship, real reform regarding the police and armed forces remains one of the unpaid debts of the political transition. However, all of those interviewed, interviewed within the counter movement group with some nuances defend and justify police action and their monopoly on violence. They contextualize the excessive use of force on protesters and seek exceptional sanctions for, protect, for the protesters' transgressions against social order and private property. They see the criminalization of the protest as the best punishment. Although Chilean armed institutions are undergoing a legitimacy crisis, the defense of police action is one of the characteristic elements of this new right in Chile. This leads us to some great paradoxes in, the, uh, in this disarticulated framework of, the, of this specific right wing's counter movement. There is a police force without a state, patriotism where patriotism and state are disarticulated. Patriotism stems from the community and the state is seen as a discredited bureaucracy. The criticism of globalization and global ethics, such as human rights as a moral framework, 
articulate feeling of this tribe of distrust that these groups express against global institutions. While in the interviews to the counter movement, the illusion of anti-globalization is not all openly or directly stated, in contrary to the counter movement street aesthetic and rhetoric on Twitter and YouTube. And finally, uh, some considerations. After a momentary rearticulation of the right wing a few years ago, the right wing establishment is facing one of its most difficult contexts in decades. I, an establishment, I'm talking about political parties and the el political elites. However, despite its electoral decline, we see that here there is some work being done in terms of identity production and the defense of a legacy by a right wing counter movement, which take place in the margins of political parties. From the military manifestation defending members of the armed force in prison for human rights violations to the semi-religious bus for the liberty exposing anti-sexual divergence and anti-inclusive rhetoric, today we have seen a new outburst of this new right defending the neoliberal constitution in the public sphere. In Chile, anti-state liberalism seems to predominate, described in the classic ring uh, right-wing narrative, articulated as a reaction to social emancipation movements linked to identity. The neoliberal rings, as Brown describes them, are not part of the Chilean arena. These sectors do not seem to organize as a critique of the system, but as a defense of the system as it was before the others arrived and altered it, we can say. In this sense, they resist the resignification of the new narratives about the recent past, like it wasn't depression, it was capitalism. They defend a legacy. They may have sacrificed the idea of Pinochet, but not the symbol of fatherland and its patriotism. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Daniela for your intriguing contribution and well uh, we we look forward to to the public comments and now um i turn to turn the floor to um valentina who is preparing her presentation and uh, well start whenever you want thank you You need to unmute yourself, Valentina, I guess. That's no, it. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you, Alicia. Uh, to start, I would like to thank Alicia Salomone, Lorena Ortiz Cabrero, and the MSI for hosting this event and also mention how pleased I am to be doing this presentation with Daniela and Michael. Finally, let me say that the thoughts I'm sharing here today are part, part of a collective project with Luciana Messina at the IDES Memory Studies Program. In 2015, Mauricio Macri, a candidate from Alianza Cambiemos, a party coalition described as the new right, won the Argentine presidency. Referring to this coalition as the new right, highlighted its difference from the authoritarian, nationalist, right wing movement that had, had backed countless cap d'etat since the beginning of the 20th century. What was novel about this new right-wing coalition then was its willingness to play by the roles of memory. In economic terms, Alianza Cambiemos took the same liberal and pro-market stance of its, of its right-wing predecessors. Okay. Oh, I can change. Okay, mm. I have a little problem with my 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 PowerPoint. Um, oh. Valentina, why don't you yes. send the presentation to Lorena? Because Lorena has my presentation. She Lorena, has got. Could you share the presentation? Perhaps it goes better. Yes, one second then. 
Yeah, yeah. Please, Lorena, picture two if you if you can. I I can change. This is my problem. Let's wait a minute and see. Oh, there it is. There it goes. So the next picture, if you, if you can. Okay. Okay. Um, no, the the before this, the other. Okay. Okay. This. Um, Alianza Cambiemos came to power at the moment when dozens of trials were underway for a broad of set of individuals responsible for state terrorism. By 2015, nearly 40 sites of memory and museum had opened across Argentina. March the 24th, uh, the day of the 1976 CAP, had become the National Day of Memory for True and Justice, and state terrorism had been integrated to school curricula. All were the result of public memory policies promoted under the three Kirchner administrations. In a contest of market political polarization, the new right partly publicly expressed its desire for change with regard to this legacy. It served, as a, it served as a channel for a set of remarkably different voices and actors that disputed the way in which the dictatorial past was remembered, challenging the memory and justice policies that had prevailed under the Kirchner. Truth, different actors from a range of fields emerge, including relative or military personnel, personnel, scholars, and journalists. Though their practices and trajectories had little in common, they considered in a critical discourse of the way that the way the dictatorial past was represented. Next, please. The first voices of dissent which clamor for complete memory, rang out in 2006, when the trial for crime, crimes against humanity began anew. At the beginning, they were limited to retired military personnel and the children and grandchildren of, of those prosecuted and imprisoned for crimes under dictatorship. At that time, the voices of the military echoed in the paper La Nación, we are virtually, virtually the only ones to dispute the memories of state terrorism and question the ongoing trials. Starting in 2008, however, intellectuals, journalists, and political actors with markedly different ways also began to engage in the debate, joined by their critical take on the way memories of the recent past were narrated as well as human rights policies of the Kirchner administration. In 2008, the political conflict between the administration of President Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner and the agriculture producers helped it gradually articulate this demand, voices and actor. As the result of this conflict, a political space formed again among those who opposed the administration with the media playing a key role. The next, please. As part of this process, diverse cultural and academic produce critical of the approach to the dictatorial past began to circulate, some of which, in the case of Fuchs, became bestsellers. This disputed the critical prosecution model in light of the South Africa transitional justice option argued that the guerrilla group shared responsibility with the armed forces for what had occurred, proposes a dialogue, a dialogue in order to work through the violence, denounces the presence, of, the presence of political activists in public policies as excessive or abuse, and questioned the role of human rights organization within the Kirchner administration and in, in memory policy. Thus, a kind of synergy aroused between this critical discourse, new demands and actors involved in, a dispute, in the dispute surrounding memory. 
the new Macri administration served as a facilitator articulating these new voices, arguments and demands for the state to take action. Next, please. As part of handling of memory of the state terrorism, the Macri government set about to serve the meaning that the term human right had occurred during the Kirchner. Yet, in the work to the Kirchnerize, to borrow the term used by the human rights secretary, Claudio Abru, the action, but above all the discourses of this of diverse government official went so far as to challenge the meaning given to this term during the democratic transition. I would like to particularly focus on this critical point. The effort to undermine democratic consensus forget due to the transitional process in Argentina. The terms memory, human rights and democracy, as well as their uses and applications in the public sphere are closely linked in Argentina. They constitute a set of meaning associated with denouncing state terrorism. They disappear as the central figure in this meaning set, while a specific social actor, the human rights movement, is the main advocate and activist in this struggle. They denounce the crimes committed under dictatorship by invoking a hitherto marginal ethos, that of fundamental rights. Since then, and for over four decades, human rights has had a privileged place in national policy, a legitimate form of expression available for myriad demands and struggles. This ethos was also connected to the fact that the values and demand of this movement are incorporated to the ethical groundwork for the newly reinstated rule of law in 1983. Truth, a chain of signifiers, the human rights ethos, the democratic regime, and the duty to remember as expressed in the slogan Nunca Mas or Never Again, took hold during those years. Next, uh, Lorena, please. Let me underscore three tenets of this political and symbolic, symbolic imaginary. First, respect for human rights require a democratic political regime. Second, democracy as a political system must defer to the supremacy of the law, legally, legally an impartial institution. And third, the rule of law is saf safeguarded by the duty to remember, that demands remember remembering in order not to repeat. Overall, this grouping of signifiers, demo democracy, human rights and memory inform and shape both memory and public policies became in a place of historically available meanings, but also an object of dispute and reworked meanings. Here, I intend to, to show how La Alianza Cambiemos work in different ways to dissociate this chain of si signifiers. First, I will, I will focus on the separation of human rights from memory before turning to the anacopling of memory from justice. Next. In 2015, the administration of President Macri advanced on a new agenda that so thought, thought to this the Kirchnerize memory, which also means stripping the signifier human rights of the meaning it had acquired since the return to democracy and associated it to other meanings linked to international organizations and the world NGAO uh, associations. As Mercedes Barro has argued, the new agenda rested on a notion of human rights as a global ideology separated from singular, politically situated process, and quarishing a separation from the signifier human rights, now referred to as 21st century human rights, from the concrete experience of suffering state terrorism. As I already mentioned, the connection between these two signifiers had been forged with a no small effort since the return to democracy. The human rights paradigm was now more associated with the rhetoric of global security terms, international terrorism or political and religious 
extremism, both rampant since the drowning of the new century. Truth for faithing their connection to the long history of authoritarianism and human rights violation. This severance of human rights and state terrorism, part of the administration agenda, require new signifiers, new meaning, and new representation related to how the past is narrated. The emerging voices in the dispute surrounding memory, children of memory personal, journalists, and intellectuals, as well as the polarization that arose as part of a political antagonism, antagonism Kirchnerism versus anti Kirchnerism, were factors that nourished and gave shape to the process of sundering meanings at the government polite level. Finally, I would like to briefly discuss one of these emerging signifiers, dialogism as an artifact of memory that attempt to stand in for the trials for crime against humanity in attempt, as I mentioned, to sever memory from justice. Next. In Argentina, started in 2008, some people from different generation and background began sitting down at tables to dialogue about their experience, feelings, and opinion regarding state terrorism and political violence. These dialogues were organized as forums, conferences, or public or semi-public interviews, sometimes with a journalist present. Cultural or educational organizations like publishing houses, film production studies, or private universities promoted and organized these, uh, these events. Next. Pablo Abeluto, the head of publishing at Random House Sudamericana, play a key role as a promoter of these memory enterprises. This practice of dialogue gained new institutional support when Cambiemos won the election and Abeluto became the Minister of Culture. While traditionally, the Human Rights Department had been the agency that handled memory, memory policies, the Minister of Culture now began organizing seminars and talks aiming at thinking about ways of dealing with the violent past that did not involve the courts, that is, the benefits of transitional model, models of restorative justice based on dialogue as alternatives to the legal retributive justice model. Dia dialogue here is proposed as a new slate for traditionally progressive values like the recognition of pluralist memory. However, the plurality of voices was now at the service of revisionist discourse that relativized state terrorism. Next, as I mentioned, the performance of the dialogue brings together guest speaker whose main credential is having been involved in past events or in events somehow related to the past. The interviews of the participant, be they the relatives of the disappeared, the children of convicted military person, former militant from organization that took up arms on retired military person, are valued and recognized in the extent to which their loss of enunciation reflects their unique experiences. These experiences are convey not only, not only in a factual description of what they lived and suffered, but in an emotional and affect-based narrative where pain and, le and learning go hand in hand. A mother speaks of the pain associated with a son disappear. A daughter recounts how the, her father was assassinated by Montoneros. A former Montonero reflects on the death of his fellow militant and the son of a military officer expressed his grief on his father's imprisonment. imprisonment. All of their narrative are presented as equal. Dialogue proposes a rite of passage from confrontation to reconciliation outside of legal action. In the face of the new restorative ritual, the political identities of the collective protagonist of the memory and justice process 
that is the human rights organization, are seen as battlefields where arg arguments are polarized, positions are taken, confrontation take place, and most importantly, dialogue became impossible. In contrast, the singular experience that arises from what one, one experiences and lives in the first person inquiries as a sort of the facto relativ relativism in which all voices are recognized as valid. In this simple mind perspectivism, heterogeneous narrative representation and especially reasons are justified by each individual's particular circumstances as all the possibility of for assessing past action. Next. The past became fragmented split it into mirror events and multiple versions. In this way, unique experiences became unquestionable and irrefutable as challenging them would mark a return to the culture of confrontation that the, the dialogue seeks to, abandon, seek to abandon. Although the memory mechanism of dialogism proposes to build a pluralistic memory inhabited by different voices, it instead has a paradoxal effect, homogenizing narrative around the common denominator of suffering. The element that allows this narrative and trajectories to be grouped together is that, the, is that of considering all subjects to be equally affected by the violence of the 70s and its repercussion in the present day. The metaphor of society as a bounded body takes center stage in dial dialogism. In other words, all the, tra the trajectories and formal suffering are treated as equal, just as, as the violence perpetrated by the state is treated as equal to that of the armed force, uh, armed organization. The, the differences between forms of violence, the political process that started them and the responsibility associated with them are to, are to arise and strip it of historical context by invoking the tragedy of the 70s. In short, dialogue as a performance of memory seeks to operate on the border level of social representations and share meaning about the violent past that were reconfigurated after return to democracy. In this way, justice severed the articulate memory, severed to articulate memory and democracy. However, justice loses its potential for building a social true, guaranteeing equally before the law and serving as an ethical platform that prevents any relativizing of crime. In conclusion, Mauricio Macri administration contributed to question relativism and challenging meanings that brought social acceptance and institutional approach to the dictatorial past. Next. However, I want to emphasize that its intervention in the field of memory and human rights has involved plenty of hemming and howing. This is because society repudiated this attempt to encourage on the fields, forcing to administration to pragmatically backpedal on certain initiative in this arena. The Macri government hit up against obstacles that can be contributed to democratic consensus forget during the transition to democracy and consolidated during the Kirchner administration, particularly with regard to the role and responsibility of the state to respond for the damage caused during dictatorship. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valentina. I think that, well, uh, Daniela and, and you had presented uh, an, a scenario uh, that we not always would like to, to see, but it's very important to, to look into it and, and see how this uh, tensions evolve in, in, in the Southern Cornish uh, setting. Um, now I'm turn the floor to Michael uh, to start the comments. Excellent. 
Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, Alicia. I wanted to start out by thanking you for the kind invitation to serve as the discussant uh, for today's panel and also to the Memory Studies Association uh, for including me in this, in this great event. Uh, and thanks to Lorena Ortiz Cabrero again for a, such impeccable organization. Uh, it's certainly always a pleasure uh, to be able to uh, be with my colleagues Daniela Jara and Vantela, uh, Valentina Salvi, um, with whom it's uh, we've had some occasions to dialogue over the years. And uh, today's presentations were extremely thought provoking. And uh, I know uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions in addition to some of the ones that that I'll raise here in the next few minutes. So I wanted to start out uh, by actually uh, just observing that the emboldening of right-wing political forces has of course become a cause for deep concern, uh, consternation, and even revilement in many locales around the world. Our panel today, of course, is limited to the Americas, uh, but the Americas alone, if we think both North and South, have given us unfortunately much to reflect on lately uh, when it comes to this subject. Uh, I noticed the comment in the chat from Margarita Saona uh, referencing Peru and, and actually the, the same reference to Peru occurred to me uh, as, I, as I started thinking about this panel, uh, because as we speak, Keiko Fujimori, uh, the daughter of Alberto Fujimori, former Peruvian president, uh, who's currently in, in prison for ordering extrajudicial killings in the 1990s, and who herself is on the verge of imprisonment for money laundering, uh, continues to contest her recent defeat at the hands of President-elect Pedro Castillo, uh, who, as we know, is a leftist indigenous school teacher from a rural area in Peru. Uh, incensed by Castillo's razor-thin, the legitimate victory, uh, it's interesting to note that last Friday, 100 retired Peruvian military officers signed a letter vowing not to recognize Castillo if he takes office. And within this same frenzied climate in which Keiko Fujimori cried fraud in a manner similar to Donald Trump when he lost the November 2020 election to President Joe Biden, an online source uh, that came, came to light recently disgustingly published private text messages written by white males from Lima that expressed visceral anti-Indigenous sentiments and even called for the revival of practices like the forced sterilizations of indigenous women that we know took place under Fukimori. So racism, classism, anti-communist sentiment, and a fervent defense of the neoliberal order all mixed together and have reared their ugly heads once again in Peru in another local example or localized instantiation of an emboldened, and in this case, even criminal right, fearful of losing its hold on political and economic power. At the same time, if we think about Peru, the memory issue plays into it as well. Uh, there was a, a recent amendment uh, passed in Congress to the Peruvian National Law and Museums that states that the mounting of exhibits or the carrying out of activities that seek to skew the truth or the facts of past situations and that maliciously modify the collective memory of the citizens could constitute punishable infractions, which if we look at the, at the way that language is phrased, it certainly opens the door for institutions such as LUM, uh, for example, the main memory museum in Lima uh, to be attacked uh, in the future. And as we know, that has, it has also been attacked in the past. So I bring the Peruvian case to light uh, just to say that sad as this may be, this is really now an all too familiar scene throughout the Americas from the US to Peru, from Colombia to Bolsonaro's Brazil, and as Valentina and Daniela have explained from former president Macri's Argentina to Piñera's Chile. Of course, the, the transnational and even transhistorical flows of the emboldening of the right don't absolve of us of the responsibility to look closely at how these dynamics play out in local contexts. On the one hand, as Daniela pointed out, iconographies and symbols and memories travel. Uh, the new right in Chile following the October 18th, 2019 social uprising, for example, carried flags evoking Trump, as Daniela pointed out, and greeted each other uh, in certain instances, even with Nazi salutes. 
Likewise, I would add to that that in, in isolated ways, but in also telling ways in the midst of the US presidential elections and against the turbulent backdrop of the Black Lives Matter movement, Trump supporters wore t-shirts evoking Pinochet and the notorious death flights of the 1970s and 1980s, in which, as we know, the disappeared were dropped into the ocean from military planes. So such details would confirm that any discussion of the rise of the new right would necessarily require the development of a transnational framework that would seek to understand the ways in which memories and symbols travel and manifest multi-directionally to cite Michael Rothberg's term in different times and in different places. On the other hand, both of the presentations we've heard also demonstrate how important it is to pay attention to the nuance of each particular local context. The unprecedented force of the Chilean uprising, for example, has greatly diminished the relevance of the right in Chile, as Daniela pointed out at the end of her presentation, and has nearly nullified the relevance of the lame duck president Piñera, who waits out his days like Garcia Marquez's general in his labyrinth. Chile is on its way to having a much more democratic and new constitution that will be written with broad participation of women and indigenous peoples. In the US, in quite different circumstances, Donald Trump sits in his home in Mar-a-Lago, Florida, another general in his labyrinth, using social media to maintain a loyal but sizable base that continues to support him despite his debunked allegations of electoral fraud and despite the now indelible memory of the violent January 6th attack on the US Capitol. In other words, depending on timing and circumstances, the relevance of the right ebbs and flows from place to place, but the new right continues to work to gather force, and I think the presentations show this very well, and take advantage of any opportunity or moment uh, that presents. I, I really liked uh, Daniela's phrase in particular, uh, the context of opportunity for these uh, particular movements. So this is a very rich topic, which as we know, uh, scholars are exploring more and more within the field of memory studies. So I wanted to pick up on a few threads uh, just to pose some questions uh, for you know, potential consideration of, of Daniela and Valentina. Not that they would have to answer all of these questions, but uh, maybe to pick up on whichever ones seem uh, most relevant. So the first thread that I wanted to point out uh, concerns the forces of revisionism that have been at work in both Chile and Argentina. Both of the talks focus on relatively recent moments in the case of Daniela, uh, she discussed the ways in which a right-wing counter-movement gained some limited presence as a reaction to the social uprising of October 2019. And in the case of Argentina, Valentina discussed how Macrismo, as of 2015, opened spaces for certain revisionist voices to gain a certain amount of traction, some traction, I would say, in the public sphere, and for those voices to be heard and heeded, interestingly, not only by the right-wing, but also by other Argentines who did not identify with Kirchnerismo. The idea of memoria completa, complete memory in particular in Argentina, sought to relativize unsuccessfully a hard fought and firmly entrenched consensus around the defense of human rights, democracy, memory, and never again by reviving, perhaps we could say the theory of the two demons uh, La Teoría de los Dos Demonios, that had really been the bane of truth and justice efforts throughout the long transition. These recent efforts by the right to work against progressive politics and a deepening of democracy using the revision of memory as a tactic are noteworthy. But I also wonder if this kind of reactionism or revisionism can also be understood as an extension or a resurgence of other similar acts of revisionism that we've seen over time in Chile and Argentina. When I think about Chile, for example, I remember moments such as the 30th anniversary of the coup in, two, in 2003, and even the 40th anniversary, other similar moments to that, in which the television media would invite lots of political actors of different ideologies to debate over the meanings of past political violence. Oftentimes these debates would in, occur in front of backdrops on the screen in which Pinochet was on one side and Allende was on the other side, 
juxtaposed in a confrontation that in visual terms almost equalized them or canceled them out in kind of a, a Chilean version of the theory of the two demons. Likewise, we can remember many calls uh, by the right over time to contextualize, contextualizar the coup and the ensuing aftermath using a salvationist discourse according to which the military intervened to avert a supposed civil war in 1973. And even very recently in 2018, just not too long before the social uprising broke out, I remember a scene that probably many do as well of uh, then Chilean Minister of Justice Hernán Larraín on the floor of the Congress uh, debating with human rights activist and deputy Carmen Hertz in a, in a memory battle in which Larraín again kept calling on the Congress floor for the contextualization of the coup. This was the same insidious figure who had edited a book in 2013 called Las Voces de la Reconciliación, whose purpose was to bring together uh, sort of you know, picking up on what Val Valentina was saying, a whole gamut or range of political voices from right, center, and left to offer perspectives on what reconciliation means and what reconciliation might look like. Um, and the book, I think, is very similar to some of the ones you showed, Valentina, where uh, it's sort of a, an act of complete memory. But this was promulgated by a right-wing wing figure in the first place. So that really is my first question. The question is about how new really are uh, these instantiations that we're seeing right now? And to what extent uh, is it useful to kind of historicize these different moments in which the right has reared its head over time to understand uh, what we're seeing in the present? And then the, the second uh, thread that I wanted to pick up on was really has to do with kind of the relevance of these counter movements, uh, which I think it was interesting to note in both cases that they were sort of circumscribed and really never have emerged quite victorious uh, in, in the memory battle, uh, so to speak. Um, as Daniela pointed out, maybe these, uh, this counter movement was sort of restricted to certain areas within the Barrio Alto after uh, the 18 de Octubre. And as Valentina said, even though Macrismo made quite a bit of noise and there were certain memory entrepreneurs like uh, Pablo Aveluto, which I thought was really interesting, and Sudamericana, who were kind of saber rattling and, and, and doing this here and there, uh, it never really am man managed to amount to anything uh, to anything really trans transcendental or transcendent, uh, so to speak. But I think there maybe are differences between Chile and Argentina, which might be interesting to debate as well, because it seems like the circumscribed nature was even more circumscribed in Chile. Whereas in the case that you mentioned with Macrismo, because of the platform and the moment, it might have been a little bit more widespread and had gained more traction. So I wonder about those differences a little bit. And I also thought uh, about groups like uh, Historias Desobedientes, the uh, children and relatives of perpetrators, which is also, uh, it, it is a, it's a group that emerged in Argentina, a collective that emerged in Argentina, but has also become transnational uh, with instantiations in Chile and also in Brazil. And it's, uh, these groups communicate with each other and are actually calling for their military parents or relatives to remain in prison. Uh, for example. So I wonder how groups like that interact with this scene and counteract uh, the, these counter movements of the, of the new right the, that you've mentioned. And then lastly, uh, the, the, the last question that I had was about how sort of the memory scene has changed in a way in the present from the kind of old Cold War frameworks uh, that we we used and that we thought about in the past. Um, in a way, I, I thought it was really interesting, and I agree with this, Daniela, that it seems like Pinochet more and more is becoming a, an excoriated, reviled figure in Chile. And as younger generations come to the fore and assert their opinions and uh, you know didn't live through the coup and so forth, Pinochet kind of fades away. The dictator kind of fades away. And in that sense, I wonder if the memory of the transition or of the Chicago boys or of kind of the successes and failures of democracy and the transition are really kind of more at the center of what's going on now than the old Cold War frameworks. Um, so so I'll, st I'll stop there and just again, thank you for a really rich and 
and wonderful presentations. Uh, thanks to you, Michael, for your, your rich comments. Uh, they are thought-provoking <laughs> um, uh, reflections as well as, as, as the ones we heard before. And uh, well, I don't know, um, Daniela, good. I, I, I saw you, you were unmuting. Would you like to start? <laughs> Thank you, Michael, for your um, inspiring thoughts. Uh, when when I uh, listened to you, I felt that you were pointing at those very important arguments that I wanted to make and that also I identified in Valentina's work. So uh, thank you for being such a good listener. <laughs> um, you are, well, you suggest four uh, topics. Uh, they are very related between them. So I think I will start by um, thinking of uh, your question about continuities and changes, and you ask if it is um, uh, if it is important to historicize these uh, trends that we are observing. Uh, and I think, well, I, I was asking myself that question, and I think that in a in in a way, uh, social anal analysis consists of doing that. Um, reflection of both continuity and confirmation and today i wanted to precise, precisely show that uh, and i will explain how um, i think what is new in this uh, uh, right wing counter movement that is is it is very small in terms of uh, quantity in chile but it is important in terms of what it is showing um, what is new, it is, I think that it helps to understand it as part of an international framework that we are not only, this is not only happening in Chile, it has to do with something more that is a transnational in a way, and that might have to do with globalization and a form of crisis of democracy, political parties, and also, um, that is a crisis that is challenging the neoliberal paradigm. And in that way, uh, I think that that is the new here, but it is a new that we need to think in terms of 30, year, 30 years. It's not new today, I mean. Uh, I think it helps uh, to think uh, of, this, uh, of this in terms of the 90s onwards uh, from then on. Um, I, so I would, think in long historical phases uh, and I will situate this um, uh, this present, this long present uh, related to um, a, a capitalistic phase. Yeah, so in, in, in a, uh, I would situate it in that uh, scenario. Uh, but also there is something new and I think that that is fascinating in the in the in the, in the the case that I presented today, that is this shift in terms of uh, meaning, in, ter in terms of sim symbols. Um, and that's why I, um, uh, I mentioned this, uh, that we were looking for Pinotet in their interviews and we didn't find Pinotet, we found something new. And that was very striking for us as memory scholars. Uh, that we have in some way un understood the relationship to Chilean history uh, 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 spoken through the uh, symbol of Pinochet. And uh, in these uh, social manifestations and the counter movement, we found something new. And that I think is something that we uh, need to, um, to think a little bit more, how, how it happened, when it happened, <clears throat> um, uh, so I, I would say that is the the new here. Uh, so I would go in layers. So I, I would think in the, uh, the the how the symbols are changing, but in a international context that is related to um, economic system and uh, uh, the, the crisis of democracy in the uh, which is. Uh, 
um, uh, which has to do with um, with well a crisis of representation. I think that that is something that is happening in in many places and not only in the southern corn. So I would stay there for now. <laughs> Um, I don't know, Michael, if you want to comment something or we can, um, I think we, we can pass the floor to, turn the floor to, to Valentina because I, I, I think she has something to say or would you like to, to, to reply to Daniela firstly? Or? I think it's, it's great to hear from Valentina. Sure. Yeah, brilliant. So, Valen, please. Okay. Okay, how new are the revisionist re 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 idea of new uh, right? It is a, a very open question, I mean, for, 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 for the scholars. Uh, what is really new and what is old is a very important question. Although dialogism, uh, for example, and the relativism that it implies are no new in the field of memory in Argentina. New, uh, new right has the capacity to show that um, to show that it, they they were renewed. Um, dialogue dialogue has been proposed during the 90s when the law of obediencia de vida and punto final and the pardons to the repressors rewarded them uh, with impunity. At that time, sitting at the table or to dialogue became a sinister everyday scene in TV program, for example. Uh, in, the, in TV program, on the one hand, repressor uh, members, for example, of FAMU or rally, uh, relatives of victims killed by Erb or Montoneros, or, or Montoneros uh, were invited. Uh, on the other hand, they also invited Madres de Plaza de Mayo, ex detenidos desaparecido, and former guerrillas in order to have them talk together. The most uh, heated of these scenes was a violent argument between a repressor, Miguel Echecolar, and his victim, the late deputy, uh, Alfredo Bravo. Those impossible dialogues, completely impossible, fostered the idea that there were two sides, both of which had the right to be heard, and that the repressors had the right of opinion as a road to reconciliation. However, they also meant listening to them, blaming their own victims, accusing them of lying and even treating them again. What is new in relation with this TV, with those TV scenes is the language of suffering. Uh, in those uh, TV scenes, the language was uh, guilty. Now it's suffering. Uh, it is not the past, the common field to dialogue, it is the common suffering as consequence of a violent past. Um, the other questions about the impact <laughs> of, uh, of, of these uh, new right policies. In Argentina, for example, the extent and strong culture of memory produces macro administration back and force and hesitations. For example, in May 2017, when the Supreme Court concluded the two for one law was indeed applied for imprisoned repressions, when the new, this new uh, jurisprudence for sentence for crime against humanity, many convicted officers had new hopes to be freed soon. So, uh, when this census was promoted, the streets of Buenos Aires were once more filled with thousands of protesters belonging to human rights groups, survivors and relatives of disappeared with the destination to Plaza de Mayo, people who were heading home on to work or, or to work spontaneously joined the protest and walked for hours displaying ready-made banners. The metro was crammed with people whose destination was the final stop Plaza de Mayo, with a new refrain that day, nunca más un genocida suelto, never again a genocider free, 
Finally, Macri government has to turn back. So the impact uh, is uh, uh, relative. And the last question about uh, historias desobedientes. It's a very, very interesting point because some of the members of historias desobedientes start in this dialogue sense. Some of them participated in this semi-public performance of the dialogue. And then some years later, this daughter of the pressure decided to present them in public as ex-daughters. Ex in, it, it was in, in 2017 at the same time of the, the Supreme Court uh, sentence. This jump is something that has to be researched. What happened? Thank you, Michael, for your questions. Sure. No, thanks. Uh, thanks to both of you for those those great answers. I, as I was as I was listening to both of your talks too, I was thinking about just the phenomenon of dialogism in in general and just sort of over time what the motivations might be of the different political actors to participate in these particular conversations because we see them happening everywhere not just in those that are kind of staged from above through political will but you know in documentaries you know moments where victims and victimizers say let's get in front of the camera and sit down together and talk so i i wonder i mean it might be it might be possible to kind of uh, understand maybe why the those in historias desobedientes would would have done it but i think in a lot of cases it's hard to explain what what everybody seeks to gain in those particular kinds of interactions when reconciliation has really been kind of a fraught, such a fraught topic throughout all, all of the transitions. So for me, that really remains kind of an, an open question as to, as to why people uh, kind of enter into these dialogues in the first place. So Alicia, I know there's uh, questions in the chat, so. <laughs> yes, yes, we have some questions and let me have a look. Uh, there is a question by Marina. I'm, I'm going to, to oh, and we have a, just a, a new question by, by Manuela, but I, before um, uh, turning to them, I, I would like to point out the importance of discussing this topic, that on the one hand, it may be seen as very local, uh, on the other hand, as you have pointed out, um, Micah, uh, it, it is very important to look at local uh, situations to understand how they, they, they are part of trans, uh, transnational, transnational uh, framework. Uh, I, I took that concept from you um, uh, of, of people who who share some ideas and who share symbols that travel through different times and, 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 and places. Uh, and uh, for that reason, I think this is a topic of uh, critical importance, not only for the Latin American region or the Southern Corn, but well, as you mentioned, for the United States and for other places that are experiences this uh, the, the rise of these uh, new uh, moment, uh, movements pro new order uh, in, in, in the many, um, uh, how to say, frames or characteristics they may have, they are all, uh, they have a, a common ground, you know, that is uh, as, as um, uh, as um, oh, um, Valentina mentioned before, uh, and also Daniela, um, opposing social justice <laughs> uh, and uh, comparing or opposing social justice from the the individual effort corner and 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 things like that. Uh, people that are not necessarily members of the elite uh, in Latin America or other places, but are. Um, uh, are members of, 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 of the population in, in general. And, and that is something we should uh, look at. And it's a very interesting topic for, for um, uh, memory studies uh, reflection. Uh, I would like to, to ask, uh, Marina, would you like to answer your question? If you can unmute. 
yourself and ask your question if you wish. Yes, hi. Um, I, I think I, I was just writing another, I, I just can't, wait, I don't know if you see me, but I was just writing a, another comment because I think Valentina answered a little my question. So it was maybe more related about the fact that uh, dialogues can be different and the fact of sitting together and speaking when there are different parties doesn't mean that there is a real dialogue. So maybe there is some way of saving the dialogue but not all kind of dialogue. And maybe only some fruitful dialogues can be possible when certain time passed by. So it was just a reflection about what she was saying because I think she answered a little my question. So I don't know if she wants to comment. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just a question. I mean, the problem is when you want to sit in this dialogue, all, all, everybody. So this is a problem because you need a background, a common background. You have to produce this common background in this performance. It's not the same what the different persons decided to talk together. It's not the same performance. When the, the public or semi-public performance want to sit all together, <laughs> it's impossible to sit all together. You need this background that produce a, a kind of, of uh, equalization or homogenization, I know how to say. You you understand the difference? This, this is the difference between when you decided to go to dialogue and put together how this, the background in common. Yeah. Thank you. There is another question by Manuela Badilla. Uh, it's for, for both uh, Valentina and Daniela. Uh, uh, would you like Manuela to to present your question, to ask your question, or I, I don't know if you are there, yeah. Manuela? Yeah. Hola, Manu. Hola. Well, thank you all for these wonderful presentations. And uh, my question is about the new generations. Um, how do you see the role of new generations in this? Um, right-wing memory actions, considering especially that young people have been at the same time um, leading or like main actors in the new social movements that we have witnessed in all Latin America. So do you see um, their involvement as a reaction of, uh, I don't know, human rights um, memories or as a, actually something totally new. Um, and yeah, that's my question, I guess. Thank you, Manuela. Uh, Daniela? Thank you, Manu. <laughs> um, I wanted to just a few thoughts on Historias Desobedientes. Uh, what I, well, I think that they have um, uh, members. I don't know if the member is, is the right word, but I know that they have members in Chile and Argentina. What I've seen in Chile is very different to this uh, description uh, that we can call the, the, well, this kind of dialogue that is focused on suffering. I think that it's important because Michael asked about historias desobedientes. I would um, make the distinction of the their performance in Chile that has been, uh, I would say, very. Um, they haven't worked on a trauma frame. Uh, they have been very um, political in their public speech. Um, I'm thinking of. Um, the documentaries, Pepe Robano just launched his documentary and Lisette uh, about Adriana, um, also this Victoria, uh, Victoria Nato, this poetry, very dramatic, but very, uh, she's not looking for reconciliation. Uh, um, so I would, I, I think it is interesting to make distinctions and think uh, throughout that different 
uh, public performances. And also they have been very um, uh, commit, committed to the um, social movement. They, they go to the social demonstrations. Um, so it's not that they are like uh, remembering the past. It's they have um, uh, make this, uh, um, how, how can I say, they have um, understand that memory is something in the present and they are uh, performing that in a way. So I think that, that I wanted to say that. Uh, and, um, and Manu, you're asking about uh, youth and the role of new generations. I, I don't think that, that what we are, what I talked about today or on this counter movement, um, this right wing counter movement, I, I wouldn't associate it with uh, the new generations. There might be new generations there, but I think that uh, in sociological, if we think sociologically and if we situate uh, somewhere the uh, young people in Chile, they are of course part of this social mobilization, social movements towards a change, towards dignity. Uh, they are, I think they are, um, uh, they're, they are identified with the emancipatory project. So I, I, I don't, I, it's, I'm not saying that there are not young people in this counter movement, but I won't associate uh, them as an important actor within this movement. Thank you, Manuela. So I, I have to say that um, the extreme, the extreme right in Argentina is now very narrow, very little now, but uh, as the extreme right has a very important presence in media or in, in social net and in internet. So the presence of the young people, uh, you, can, you can see the presence of the young people, um, especially the anti-right movement. But how representative these groups are in relation with the huge young people in Argentina and how how is the power that these young people has inside the extreme right movement is something that I'm, I'm and I don't know you can see the present because of the the use the use they usually uh, to to the um, the internet uh, or the media, no, the presence of the young people there, you can see. But it's not particularly a youth movement. It's it's it's, it's broader, yeah, in in both cases. Uh, is there anyone who wants to make a question? I guess there is no additional comments. Mary Braniff, uh, may I read, is, is just entering, in terms of the performative and visual aspects of memory making, are there resisting right-wing political forces? Are there examples of past recent connections of memory, symbols, images, experiences of the past are used against the dominant regimes? If so, are they complicating the right-wing narrative effectively? A specific question for Valentina. What have been the key effective ways used to combat the relativism of dialogues? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, this is by Mary Braniff. Uh, I don't know if any of you want to say something. <laughs> I really don't know what is the effective gay ways used to combat the relativism of dialogue. I mean, the, the, the key point is to think the difference between this kind of dialogues that pretend to put all together. And the other kind of dialogue is the people who want and decide which is the, brand, the background or the consensus of the point to be engaged with the other in this, recognizing the differences. 
But the point is well, to try to put all together, uh, trying to show that there's no conflict there. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if it is the case, perfectly. But... OK. Uh, so if there are no more questions, I think we are done. We are finished. Uh, well, I must say that I'm extremely grateful to you all for these very thoughtful presentations. And thank you for the people attending this webinar. Um, we have a, a, a consistent audience uh, that remained until the end of this seminar. And of course, uh, the video recording will be available for all of you and, and, and the people who want to, to, to watch it uh, on the MSA webpage in, in the section uh, dedicated to the DMSA um, uh, events. Um, so, yeah, I, I was looking at the chat and they are, uh, well, many thanks from, from different um, sites and, uh, well, I don't know if you would like to, to make any final remarks, Michael, Daniela, Valentina, no? That's it? Okay, so if, um, if there is anything else, uh, I want to say thank you. I want to say gracias. Eh, creo que merecemos un, un saludo en, en, en castellano. Uh, para cerrar este, este evento. Uh, I'm very grateful. I, I know that we are uh, communicating in, in, in a language that is not our first language. This is an additional effort I, I want to, 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 to thank to you. So thank you and thank you to you all. And I look forward to see you soon. Bye bye. Chao, muchas chao, gracias chao, a todos. Gracias, chao, chao. Chao. Chao, gracias. Bien.